Hi, my name is Lee Finnegan, and I am a pediatrics intern, as well as a step one and two tutor and content creator for Med School Coach. Uh, so this week's question of the week is for the USMLE step two, um, and here's our question. A 23-year-old woman presents to her gynecologist for irregular menses. The patient reports that she had menarche at age 12, and since then her menses have always been irregular, with an average of about four menses per year. When she does have menses, they are prolonged with heavy bleeding. The patient's medical history is notable for facial acne, which is treated with, with topical clindamycin and tretinoin, and one urinary tract infection last year, which was treated with antibiotics. She is sexually active with one male partner and uses condoms for contraception. Her vital signs are a temperature of 37.2 Celsius, pulse of 78 per minute, blood pressure of 115 over 80, and respiratory rate of 14. She has a BMI of 32. Her physical examination is notable for facial acne and hirsutism. Her pelvic exam is notable for a well-rugated vagina with a regular-sized mobile uterus and bilaterally enlarged ovaries without cervical motion tenderness or adnexal tenderness. A urine beta HCG is negative. The physician considers putting the patient on an oral medication to relieve her symptoms, regulate her periods, and prevent future malignancy. Which of the following would be a contraindicating, a contraindication to starting such a medication? A, migraine with aura. B, history of first trimester spontaneous abortion without clear cause. C, use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for menstrual cramps. D, hypothyroidism treated with levothyroxine. Or E, von Willebrand's disease. So this question is requiring you to do a few things. You have to figure out what it's asking you really is what's a contraindication to starting the medication. So to do that, you have to know what the medication is, as well as what it's, what it's then once you've figured that out, then you need to know what its uh, contraindications are. So to figure out what medication this is, you need to know what we're treating. So that's kind of where the rest of the question comes into play. And there are some hints here about what condition she has. So if we look at it, she's had, she has irregular menses, which have always been irregular. Average of about four menses per year. So that's oligomenorrhea, right? She's not bleeding every month. Here, she's bleeding about every three months. When she does have menses, they're prolonged with heavy bleeding. Her medical history is notable for facial acne. So that's important too. Um, so other things on her vital signs that are important, BMI of 32, so she's obese. Um, and again, we have the facial acne and hirsutism, so probably some facial hair or darker coarser body hair. Um, her pelvic exam is notable for bilaterally enlarged ovaries. And of course, in any reproductive age woman, woman particularly one presenting with amenorrhea, you always want to know she's pregnant. So her HCG is negative. So we've got enlarged ovaries, signs of hyperandrogenism with like the hirsutism and the acne, and um, oligomenorrhea, which is the classic triad for polycystic ovarian syndrome. So polycystic ovarian syndrome is an endocrinopathy characterized by the classic triad of what we just said, anovulation, which leads to oligo or amenorrhea, hyperandrogenism, and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. We don't have the ultrasound here, but we can be pretty sure based on the fact that she definitely has those first two and the fact that she has bilaterally enlarged ovaries that those are probably polycystic. Um, the the uh, anovulation causes oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea because you never have that LH surge in the middle of the in the middle of the menstrual cycle when you have ovulation. So when you don't have that LH surge, you just continue the proliferative phase. So you never have the you never go from the proliferative to the secretory phase. You never have the progesterone that causes that because you don't have the LH surge, which causes the surge in progesterone. So without that LH surge and without the progesterone, you have unopposed estrogen, and the unopposed estrogen causes the endometrial tissue to proliferate and proliferate and proliferate and proliferate and proliferate until eventually it just outstrips its blood supply and becomes unstable, and then it sheds. So that's the period that you get in polycystic ovarian syndrome is when you've built up so much endometrial lining that it's unstable and it sheds. Um, an important clue on history is that these irregular menses started at menarche. So these women never had normal periods that came every 28 to 35 days. Complications of this include infertility, because you have to ovulate to get pregnant. So, um, so infertility is a big issue. The endometrial hypertrophy is really the one that we worry about the most. Um, because again, you, are have, you have unopposed estrogen. So you're constantly giving the endometrium the signal to proliferate 
all the time because you don't have the progesterone effect to counteract and counterbalance that estrogen, which can eventually cause endometrial hyperplasia, which can eventually lead to endometrial cancer. So that's why we care about polycystic ovarian syndrome um, medically. Uh, in a woman who has no interest in being pregnant, so doesn't care about the infertility, we still are worried about that, um, about that risk of endometrial hypertrophy and cancer. It also increases your risk of insulin resistance, so type 2 diabetes as well. So the treatment is what we're being asked about here, which is combined oral contraceptive pills. Now, the reason why we care about, about putting women with PCOS on OCPs, people always say it's to regulate the periods which is true because it's kind of a nuisance for these women frequently to kind of not know when their periods are gonna come and things like that. But amenorrhea by itself isn't dangerous. We have pills that, or pills and IUDs that cause amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea. It's not not having a period that's dangerous to these women. What's dangerous is the fact that they have unopposed estrogen. So it's really the unopposed estrogen that's causing the problem. And we want to balance out that estrogen with progesterone. So that's why we put them on combined oral contraceptives. Um, we do that to, it's, to, regulating the periods is kind of a, is a benefit for many women, but it's really to counteract that estrogen with some progesterone to prevent that endometrial hyperplasia. Remember, they're not going to solve the anovulation because obviously combined oral contraceptives prevent you from ovulating. Other things, you give metformin for in, insulin resistance, and clomiphene citrate for the infertility. We're not gonna get into that today. So we figured out what this woman has, and we figured out what the oral medication we're gonna give her to relieve her symptoms, regulate her periods, and prevent future malignancy is. So we figured out that that's a combined oral contraceptive pill, which we're gonna to use to treat polycystic ovarian syndrome. So now we're asking, what is a contraindication to starting combined oral contraceptive pills? Well, combined oral contraceptives contain estrogen and progestin, which is a synthetic progesterone. Um, and what they do is that they provide negative feedback to the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus and the pituitary, giving you decreased FSH and LH, which inhibits ovulation and endometrial proliferation. Again, this is why we want to put this woman in particular on combined oral contraceptives. She's not ovulating to begin with, but we want to stop that endometrial proliferation. Have, you have the withdrawal bleed at the end of the month or the end of the pill pack, um, which gives you, which allows the endometrial lining to shed. Some of them now don't have that. And, you know, you can have the ones that have four menses a year or no menses a year or whatever. So we're using it for here, prevention of endometrial cancer and anovulation. And the biggest side effect is hypercoagulability. This is the one we care about the most. They can also raise the blood pressure so they can cause hypertension as well. But estrogen, remember, is procoagulant. So when you're giving exogenous estrogen, particularly to a woman in, uh, um, when you're giving exogenous estrogen, you are increasing your risk of hypercoagulability um, and therefore of DBTs, PEs, stroke, et cetera. So you don't wanna give these to women who have risk factors for hypercoagulability to begin with. If they have a history of a DBT, if they're smokers more than age 35, if they have family history of, um, of any kind of, uh, the family history of unknown of like PEs or DVTs or strokes of unknown cause, particularly at younger ages, that can be a big contraindication. Obviously, if they have a known prothrombotic disorder like factor V Leiden or something like that, that would be a big contraindication. And then a big one that people don't always think about is migraines with aura, because it's thought that if you have migraine with aura, you are at increased risk of thrombotic stroke. And so by adding an oral contraceptive pill with estrogen onto that, then you are in even increasing that risk of stroke even further. Everyone has a small increase in, in stroke risk when they go on and a combined oral contraceptive pill. But for most people, that risk, most young women who are going to be on them, that risk is still negligible. Um, but if P and people with any of these risk factors, it becomes more of a risk than people are willing to take on. So then we would, uh, it would be a contraindication to starting them on estrogen-containing oral contraceptive pills. So going back to our question here, which of the following would be a contraindication to starting this medication? The answer is A, migraine with aura. There's no contraindication in history of spontaneous abortion. Um, 
uh, unless that spontaneous abortion we know, unless that spontaneous abortion was caused by a thrombophilia, which we know sometimes can, but a, just any first trimester spontaneous abortion without a clear cause, that's not a contraindication. Uh, NSAIDs aren't a contraindication. Hypothyroidism treated with levothyroxine, you will need to change your dose of levothyroxine once you start taking estrogen containing OCPs, but that's not a contraindication. It's just something to be aware of. And von Willebrand's disease is an inherited, thrombo is an inherited um, bleeding disorder, um, so not something that we would worry about. If it were an inherited clotting disorder like factor V Leiden, that would be different, but for bleeding disorders, we don't worry about them. And that is today's question of the week. <laughs>